thank you so much, everybody, for joining us for tonight's Sheila session. Um, the session is titled A Day in the Life with an Engineer, and we are joined by Nina Arcot. Um, before I pass it over to her, I'll just do some quick house uh, house rules types of thing. Um, housekeeping. That was the word I was thinking of. Um, if you came in a little bit late, I'll just say again, my name is Annalise Schrader. I am your moderator for all of the Sheila sessions and your main point of contact for the program. You've probably been getting emails from me. If you ever have any questions about anything, um, you can email outreach at SWE.org. Um, happy to help and answer any questions that you all have. Um, tonight, um, Nina is going to be giving a presentation on a day in the life uh, as an engineer. If you have any questions, I recommend writing them down on like a piece of paper near you. Um, you can always put them in the chat. It's just that sometimes they get lost, you know, over the course of the session. So if you, I recommend writing them down and saving them for later because there will be a Q&A where you'll have the opportunity to ask those questions. Um, this session is being recorded. So if you want to watch back, it'll be posted on YouTube and I will send the link to you all when that is available, probably sometime late this week, early next week. Um, and I'll give a quick shout out to our sponsors. We have Honda, Exxon Mobil, Honeywell, Avnet, the Catherine McQuaid Foundation, and Danaher. And I'll tell you guys a little bit about Nina. Um, Nina Arcot is an aerospace engineer in the Future Technical Leaders Rotational Program at the at Northrop Grumman, um, currently exploring digital transformation in the space sector. Prior to FTL, she was a mission assurance lead for a product line of small satellites and collaborated with program managers, supply chain planners, and other engineers to increase efficiency and tackle challenges that came up during manufacturing and testing. Um, so super excited to be joined by Nina tonight. And I'm going to I'm gonna toss it over to you, Nina. Um, take it away. Yep, sounds good. Um, I will start sharing my screen. Thank you for the for the introduction. I'm really excited to to be here and and talk to you all about um, kind of my experiences in in aerospace engineering and in some uh, sort of adjacent fields as well. Let's see. So I'll start with just a little bit of background information about me and what I plan to to talk about today. So I I grew up in northern New Jersey, about 30 miles west of New York City. And I've been interested in space since I was in elementary school. I don't really know why or, or how that interest started. A lot of people have these kind of like cool stories of things that sparked their interest in space. I don't have that. I just kind of thought it was cool and, and tried to learn as much as I could about it um, starting in elementary school and kind of continue on, continuing on since then. So after, after finishing college and eventually going to grad school, I've had a few different roles, um, specifically within aerospace and in some adjacent fields as well. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that um, kind of in the, the second half of the presentation. And outside of school and work, um, sort of my, my main passion has been STEM outreach since high school. I've been involved with a few different organizations over the years, including SWE. Um, and outside of that, the main thing I, I do in my free time is watch sports, uh, both on TV and like going to actual games. That's one of the, the main things that my family uh, does together. So I have a picture on the slide um, with my brother and my fiance when we went to a football game in Atlanta uh, earlier this year. And in terms of what I'll, what I'll cover today, I'll go through kind of my educational path starting in, in high school, um, along with some of the internships that I had um, throughout college and then information about um, all the full-time roles that, that I've had, along with some kind of specific details about two of those roles, just to kind of give you a sense of kind of the different um, type of work that you can do as an engineer. And like Annalise said, we'll have time at the end um, for, for Q&A. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer questions about literally anything. So feel free to ask questions, um, you know, even if I haven't specifically brought up a topic um, in my presentation. So yeah, thinking thinking back to high school, at the time, I honestly didn't really know what engineering was. Um, I knew it existed. I knew a couple of people who were engineers, but I, I didn't know what it was or if it was something that I would, I would really want to do. Um, what I did know is that my favorite classes were usually math and science. Um, so I kind of have a bit in common with, with some of you in the chat sharing, you know, your favorite classes kind of being a variety of things within STEM. And within math and science, I always wanted to know more about 
how we could take what we were learning and apply it in different ways. And sometimes I would ask my teachers, hey, like, why does this matter? Why do we need this? How, how does this actually get used in the real world? Um, and over time, I kind of realized that a lot of times the answer to that question is that engineers would use those principles to try to try to find different creative ways to solve problems. And I think I didn't fully figure out that I wanted to be an engineer until I was probably halfway through college. Um, as I was starting uh, 12th grade, I had to kind of figure out where to, where to apply for college and, um, you know, in some cases had to like pick a specific school within the college. And the general consensus I had heard was that it's easier to switch out of engineering than into engineering. And so I just kind of applied for engineering programs and sort of figure it out from there. Um, in terms of some of the, the different STEM classes and other activities that I did while I was in high school, um, I was able to take a couple classes about computer science and robotics. Those are kind of my first exposures to engineering topics. Um, and I was able to continue my interest in space through electives um, about astronomy and all the things you would need to consider when planning a mission to Mars. And a lot of people have also asked me kind of what, what extracurricular activities I did throughout high school to kind of be prepared um, to be an engineer. And like I said, I didn't know that I wanted to be an engineer. So it's not like I started doing those things specifically to become an engineer. I just sort of did things that I was interested in and enjoyed and had fun doing. And so the, the main thing I did was um, math team. I did different math competitions throughout middle school and high school. And as I was in high school, I also started volunteering at our middle school math program. Um, and that was kind of my, one of my first experiences with um, like volunteering and STEM outreach and kind of realizing that that was something that I really enjoyed as well. I also had an opportunity to work on um, a project about asteroids. So I have that pictured on the slide. Um, I worked with a team to create a device that would essentially measure how magnetic a rock was. And the idea is that you could take that device and sort of throw it at an asteroid and it would tell you how likely it is to contain water. And then I also volunteered at um, different space camps in my area. So I had attended these week-long space camps um, when I was growing up. I was able to volunteer and then work at them as I got older. So shifting years to college, like I said, I kind of, I was vaguely interested in engineering when I started college, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do other than knowing that I liked space. And so I ended up majoring in mechanical and aerospace engineering. And I also decided to minor in material science. And throughout high school, my favorite class had always been chemistry. And I kind of considered being a chemistry major at some point or doing chemical engineering. But eventually this was a balance that, that I found worked well for me where I could explore all of my interests in space, but then also get some of the aspects of chemistry that I enjoyed as well. And I put a bit of information here, just going over what it's what it's generally like to uh, study engineering. So you usually start off with different um, engineering prerequisite classes. So math, physics, chemistry, different lab classes, computer science. Once you finish those, you can go into the fundamental classes for whatever department you're in. So for me, that was things like thermodynamics, fluids, structures, dynamics, controls. And then after that, you get even more specific and find the things within your major that really stick out to you. Um, so for me, that was all of the um, aerospace classes and then the requirements for the uh, materials minor that I was doing. And outside of class, uh, my main commitment was with the uh, rocketry club. And kind of similar to um, like math team when I was in high school, you know, I was involved with it from kind of the, the technical side where I was involved in different different project teams. So I have a picture there from a, a high power rocket launch um, where I, I made that rocket and then launched it and successfully recovered it. Um, it was very cold that day, hence the giant like jacket and hat and all of that. Um, and I also was involved in projects related to designing a tool that would be used in microgravity, um, as well as kind of a concept paper for um, lunar habitats. And beyond the technical projects, I was also the outreach lead for the rocketry club. Um, so we had a few different uh, community rocket launches or rocket building workshops, um, along with some events at different schools um, and, and student groups in our area. And everyone at my school was required to do some kind of senior thesis or capstone project. And 
for my project, I chose to focus on 3D printing for metal alloys, especially lightweight alloys like aluminum that you would use um, for aerospace. And so my project focused on sort of designing that 3D printing system and coming up with a, a test plan um, for, for the uh, different materials. So while I was in college, I think some of the most valuable experience that I gained was through summer internships. And that really gave me a sense of what it would be like to work in industry and take the different things that I was learning in class and sort of apply them to the real world. Um, so my, my first summer, I did research on campus. I was in a lab that works on different telescope technologies. And so I was just working on some of their, some of their testing and you know, figuring out different experiments that they could do. My second summer, I had the opportunity to intern at the NASA Langley Research Center in Virginia, and I was in their material science branch working on a project to synthesize and test polymers. And the idea is that the polymers are used in these composite payload booms that are sort of rolled up and stowed during launch. And when they get to space, they have to deploy and extend. But the problem is that when they're rolled up, the the shape can change a lot. And then when they go to deploy them, it's not as structurally sound as they need to be. So we were trying to find polymers that have better properties so that they'd be able to survive that stowage pe period without uh, changing too much. And then I did a couple internships at um, startups through a couple different aerospace fellowships. Um, so the Matthew Yuzakovitz Fellowship was focused on connecting students with different opportunities within the commercial space industry. So I spent a summer at Axion Systems, which is now called Revolution Space, and they work on electro, electro spray thrusters that are about the size of a stamp. And I was basically a, a process engineer in this role where they were having an issue with performance um, for thrusters that they were making with a new manufacturing method. And I had to find a way to uh, take those thrusters and do some kind of post-processing treatment in order to um, make them make them work better. So I kind of tried out different, different processes and uh, tested that with samples, looked at the results and, and saw you know, what worked and what didn't work. And the summer after I graduated, uh, I did an internship at Loft Orbital through the Brooke Owens Fellowship. So the Brooke Owens Fellowship is a program for um, undergraduate women and gender minorities who are interested in the aerospace industry. And they, they connect people with um, an internship and mentor, mentorship in the industry along with a really great community. Um, so for anyone interested in aerospace, I definitely recommend looking into that um, once, you're, once you're in college and would be eligible for that. Um, but while I was there, I was on the mechanical engineering team. I worked on a technical memo about space hazards, specifically atomic oxygen. And I um, basically the point of that was to have someone look at a satellite and its mission and quickly figure out how much um, how much of a hazard atomic oxygen would be to the spacecraft. And then I also was able to sort of continue some of the work I'd done for my senior thesis related to 3D printing and figure out if they could start using 3D printing for some of their components. And so the last thing I'll cover before shifting into my, my full-time roles. So I, I had an opportunity to do a one-year um, coursework-based master's program with tuition fully covered. Um, so just to give you a sense of the, the timeline, I so I finished undergrad in 2020, worked for about a year, and then my engineering school started up this master's program and, and offered us this opportunity uh, to the people who had graduated um, during the COVID pandemic. And so I was able to sort of take almost a one year break um, from my job and go go and do this master's program. And while there, I kind of continued to focus a bit on uh, material science. And I also looked into manufacturing as well. And I'll touch on this a little bit once I get to um, kind of my full time jobs. But once I had started working, I realized that manufacturing is a really big challenge within the industry and is sort of one of the one of the main areas I found to sort of take um, take my material science background and apply it to, to what's going on um, within aerospace. And so um, I took kind of a variety of classes related to aerospace topics, manufacturing, and some more, uh, I guess, specific materials classes. And I also was able to do research um, while I was in grad school. So 
I was working in um, a, a lab focused on space physics instruments. And there is a, there's a specific um, component within space instruments um, that is used for particle identification. So that component is an ultra thin carbon foil. And the way it works is when particles enter the instrument, they hit the foil and the foil releases atoms. And depending on the atoms that get released, it can figure out what the particle was. But the problem is that the foil gets very uh, contaminated when we're going through the process to actually get it into the instrument. So I was looking at how we can reduce that contamination. So we improved the, the setup as a way to, um, you know, just make the process more stable and repeatable. And we looked at several different process parameters, created samples with different combinations, and then analyzed the samples with two different forms of microscopy to understand how much contamination there was and what the contamination was made of, just so that we could figure out what process parameters would work best. All right, so now going into a little bit of information about kind of my full-time roles after after finishing school. And I think one of the, the main things that I kind of wanted to get across to all of you is that, you know, I've been, so I've been working um, in industry for about three to four years, depending on how you count it. Um, but I've been able to have a really wide range of experiences in a short period of time. And that's a really, a really great way to sort of learn about the industry and, and where, where I want to kind of contribute going forward. So my first role um, was in mission assurance for a product line of small satellites. And this was a really, a really great way to figure out all of the things that go wrong on a satellite program. So I was involved with all of the different satellite subsystems and all of the different program phases. So starting from the proposal into the design phase and the procurement where we're buying all the parts for it and then manufacturing. And then finally, integration and test or INT for short, where everything kind of comes together and gets tested at the spacecraft level. My, my next role um, was as part of a rotation program. So last summer, I started this three-year rotation program, and my first role in that program um, was in advanced manufacturing within our maritime division. So this is the one role I've had that's not within aerospace, but I was able to really dive into my interest within manufacturing engineering learning about kind of a wide range of technologies, especially additive manufacturing and using simulations to analyze uh, human factors concerns for different designs. And I also got some exposure to project management and coordination um, within sort of the technology accelerator, which is kind of kind of like a maker space um, where I was working on that team. And the role that I, I just started as my second rotation in the program, so I just started this role about three weeks ago, so I'm still kind of figuring out what it is, what it entails, what all my tasks are going to be. Um, but it's with the Space Sector Digital Engineering team at my company, and I'm specifically focused, at least for the first few months, on product lifecycle management. And a lot of what, what the team is trying to do is find find digital tools that we can use sort of across all the different teams at the company to make it easier to collaborate and kind of share lessons learned. That way we're not constantly reinventing the wheel um, as, we, as we go through uh, different programs. And beyond that, I'm able to learn about just what the space sector is working on, what different leaders care about within the company and where they see sort of future growth. And so it's been a really great way to understand kind of my my place within within the company and where where I want to go uh, moving forward. And I think in, in the future, I want to find a way to sort of combine the different things that I've worked on so far. So if I'm able to take all of the manufacturing stuff that I've done and apply it to something similar to the small satellite programs that I used to work on, I think that would be kind of my, my ideal role um, sort of in, in the short term. So just to expand a little bit on, on the mission assurance role that I had. So I mentioned that I was able to work on pretty much all of the, the different subsystems in the sa satellite, which is, which is really cool, just being able to have that exposure um, so early on within my career. And I, I found a couple of graphics that sort of just go through sort of generally some of the different subsystems. So starting with the one on the left, um, there's the antenna, which is how you kind of talk between the satellite and Earth. Um, the solar panels or the power system. Um, so that was an area where we were mostly working with kind of other other sites or suppliers, but 
still getting involved um, when when different things would go wrong or we had to evaluate different risks. There's the engine or the propulsion system, which helps the satellite um, move around and complete its mission. And then they also have the protective covering, which is kind of a layer of insulation that shields the satellite from different uh, temperatures or other hazards. And then sort of the image on the right has some of the, the same thing. So there's a communication device, same thing as the antenna system. Um, the power source is the same as the, the solar panels. And usually you'd also have batteries in conjunction with that. Um, there's the the science instruments, which is whatever whatever payload your satellite happens to have. So that could be, you know, a camera if it's an imaging payload, um, or certain certain like sensors or communication devices if it's helping to communicate on Earth, things like that. Um, the orientation finder is something that kind of tells you where the satellite is in space. So we use kind of a combination of cameras and sensors to figure out, you know, if the satellite is, is upside down from the way it's supposed to be or where it is in its orbit. Um, and that's really important if you have to kind of move around and, and find other things within space. And then lastly, it has the uh, container. So that's the overall structure of the satellite. Um, and, and so that's something where, you know, we would have different different composite panels or metal panels that would kind of come together and we'd install sort of different different pieces and parts um, on each of those panels before folding up the overall spacecraft. And in terms of kind of specifically what, what I was working on, we had four manufacturing work centers that, that I worked with. Um, one of them was the propulsion work center where it was mostly kind of the the engine that's mentioned along with the container, so the, the propulsion system and the overall structure um, would get built in that work center and we would kind of help with any defects that popped up there. There's the um, antenna center that would be built in our electromechanical work center. So that was a, a work center where they would do kind of a mix of things like soldering or machining um, to create the, the antennas. Um, and the ant antennas would then have to go through a few different types of testing. So there's um, functional testing and environmental testing. Functional testing tells you whether the, the part is working and then environmental testing tells you whether it's going to survive during launch and while it's on orbit. And then the, the last two work centers that I worked with were the harness work center um, and then the kind of electronics or avionics testing lab. So with harnesses, um, those are wire harnesses that connect all the different different parts on a satellite. And with avionics, our avionics or electronics boxes would combine different sensors and electronic components to kind of talk to each other and tell different parts of the satellite what to do. And in all of those cases, you would also have the same functional and environmental testing, like I mentioned with the um, with the antennas, where you make sure the thing works and then you make sure it'll sur survive the different conditions that it needs to. And, and yeah, just to elaborate a little bit on kind of my my day to day in this role. Um, so I was working with a really wide range of people. And so I had to learn a lot about how to how to communicate with different audiences, depending on who you're talking to, they care about different things. So you have to tailor the conversation accordingly. So I worked with other engineers on all of the different subsystems that I was just talking through. Um, the different work center personnel. So that could be, you know, quality engineers specific to that work center or some of the manufacturing or testing technicians working on the floor or the managers in those work centers as well. There were the program managers who are responsible for schedule and budget on all our programs. So they would need to know when something was going wrong, you know, how much that would impact um, the cost or the schedule uh, for, for the program. And then lastly, supply chain planners. A lot of times if something broke, we would need to order a new one. And so we would need to work with the planners to, to make that happen. And in terms of kind of common tasks that I was working on, so like I mentioned, there were all those different subsystems that would get manufactured. And anytime there was a non-conformance, so that could be a manufacturing defect or a test failure. Um, I was I was part of the team that would sort of lead the response to get that figured out. So figuring out how to troubleshoot it, how to fix it, um, and then eventually going through root cause and corrective action to help make sure that the defect doesn't happen again. And then I also became the lead on my team 
for some different program quality metrics. So I was on some programs that were um, struggling to stick to the budget that we had. And so it became really important for leadership to understand what was going on and how we could fix it. So I was looking at different data sources, compiling all the information in Excel, and then creating PowerPoints to kind of present that to leadership and understand you know, their concerns and how we could um, improve things going forward. So in terms of typical deliverables or outputs that, that our team would have, there were the uh, material review board packages that would kind of summarize everything from those non-conformances. Um, and then there was also the mission assurance statuses that would get presented to the customer, kind of similar to the metrics that I was talking about, um, but kind of focusing on, on different details. And in terms of what I, what I liked about this role, I liked how much I was able to learn in a short period of time. And I think you learn a lot when you're kind of learning about all of the, the things that, that go wrong. Um, but in terms of, you know, something I, I found that I would want to change in a future role, this, this type of position ended up being a little bit too broad for me. It's the kind of thing where you need to know a little bit about a lot of things. And I felt like I was making more time, spending more time kind of asking other engineers the right questions and making sure they were focusing on the right work as opposed to kind of doing the technical analysis myself. So when I was able to explore that manufacturing role, that one I definitely was able to dive a bit more into the, the technology on a day-to-day -day basis. So the four main technologies that the team was working on uh, were augmented reality, um, where you use a um, an iPad or a headset to kind of overlay information on top of existing assemblies. And that kind of helps you figure out the status of things or walks you through um, assembly steps more easily than paperwork instructions. Um, there's also collaborative automation. So those are robotic arms that are meant to work side by side with people. So my team was working on a project focused on um, using those collaborative robots or cobots for short as one of the steps in the harness manufacturing process. So the most tedious step in that process is putting individual pins in every single slot in a connector. So if we're able to automate that and then let the technicians focus on the more complex tasks, then we can make it um, overall more efficient. And then for additive manufacturing, um, that's kind of building things layer by layer. I was leading one project related to polymer additive manufacturing, trying to create a process to um, take existing designs and convert them to be made with additive manufacturing instead of machining and creating kind of the engineering justification about why we can still maintain all of the requirements, um, even though it's 3D printed instead of machined. And the last image kind of on the, the bottom middle there, um, I was I was leading the um, leading the creation of a new process for human factors analysis. So the site I was at got this new tool called the Hive, which stands for Highly Immersive Virtual Environment, and that kind of combines virtual reality and manufacturing simulations in order to do human factors analysis. So we were able to. Um, put different models in the simulation environment and have someone put on a motion capture suit and sort of walk around, try things out, see what they can reach or what they can't reach and understand how well different designs and manufacturing processes are suited um, to a range of, of different um, humans. And just going through kind of the same summary on this role. So here, um, it was definitely a little bit more, more technical. The people I was working with beyond the manufacturing engineering team included um, systems engineers, uh, design engineers who kind of knew, they knew exactly where, where things could be placed. So if I said, hey, it'll be a lot easier for someone to reach this or do this process if you move this by like four inches, they were the ones who could go and confirm whether that move was possible and then go and update the design. And then uh, lastly, the operations program managers. So those are kind of similar to program managers, but they're specifically focused on kind of the, the manufacturing and then integration and testing portion of a program. So a little bit more hands-on in that sense. And in terms of the tasks that I was working on, um, I, I was on the team where we were trying to figure out how to develop these new technologies and 
help them reach a point where you can actually use them on the manufacturing floor. But then a lot of times the hard part was actually deploying them. So using the 3D printing uh, project as an example, we already know how to how to 3D print things. So we've been doing that for, for a long time at this point. Um, now it comes down to figuring out how to actually convince a program to use that and, and justify that it's okay. And then when it comes to the augmented reality, we already, we know that it works. We've shown that it improves efficiency. We know how to create the augmented reality experiences. Um, but the hard part is sort of convincing different teams to, to use that um, on, a more, on a more regular basis and get used to the technology. So in terms of the typical deliverables that, that we had in this role, um, some of the projects were internal R&D projects as opposed to like a, a government customer funded program. Um, and so for those, those uh, IRAD projects, we would have different technical summaries showing, you know, what we were, do what we were doing, the progress we were making, any places we were, where we were behind. We also had to kind of keep track of the schedule and budget ourselves. For those IRADs, it's kind of just a few people working on it. So we were a lot of different hats, both technical and non-technical. And then lastly, we were um, creating proposals for future IRAD projects. So um, this spring and summer, we were working on the pr proposals for the projects that the team will be working on next year. And then on the human factors side of things, um, we would typically have kind of a big detailed PowerPoint at the end with all of the results and recommendations from the assessment. So we would have screenshots from the from the simulation showing what worked or what didn't work and kind of a clear bulleted list um, explaining what we would recommend to the design team. And in terms of what, what I liked about this role, it was kind of the, the perfect way to take what I had learned about um, in school and sort of the, the aspects of manufacturing that I had been a um, exposed to and really expand on that um, and be able to sort of dive into the um, like the technical details myself. Um, and it was also a really good balance for me between the technical tasks as well as some of the non-technical sort of management or coordination work. Um, I've been finding that I, you know, I really enjoy the technical work, um, but I also enjoy being able to work on some of the other other aspects of of different different projects, maybe 10 to 20% of the time, kind of getting a bit more of that like management or, or leadership experience. And the main thing that I that I took away from the experience that I can kind of apply going forward to to see um, you know what I want to do in the future, I found that some aspects of the the team culture just weren't weren't a great fit for me just based on kind of the the site and the location. And so I now have kind of a better understanding of you know different different things I prioritize and how to sort of ask different questions um, when interviewing for, for a role to understand what the culture is like and, and making sure that it'll be a good fit for me. And then this is this is the last slide that I have just with some kind of like quick, quick takeaways. Um, the first few are all kind of related, but I think the biggest thing is don't worry if, if you don't know what you want to do. I'd say I'm still kind of figuring out um, what I want to do with my career. I a lot of times um, when talking to people who are even, you know, in the middle or later stages of their career, they also joke that they're still kind of figuring out what they want to be when they grow up. Um, so don't be afraid to take the time to explore different things, figure out what you like, and sometimes even more importantly, figure out what you don't like. Um, I think a lot of things are, are worth trying even for, for a little bit. Um, I've had a really good experience being able to do this um, rotation program. And I also know people who have done They've been able to get kind of a similar experience by just switching switching teams um, sort of every two to three years early on in their career um, just to kind of get different exposure. And, and I found that, you know, it's good to have an overall plan and know generally, you know, what, what you sort of want to do and the impacts that you want to have, um, but kind of find the balance that works for you in terms of having a plan so you're not just wandering aimlessly, but you still being adaptable since things are always always going to change. Um, and then kind of the last two bullet points, I think I found that the most important thing to be a good engineer um, is being being able to ask questions and solve problems. And that all comes with just being interested in engineering and wanting to learn. I think a lot of people get get really bogged down thinking that they need to be really good at, at math and science and all those other things. 
Honestly, I don't know the last time I used math in my job. Any math that I need to do, Excel does for me. Um, and so, you know, it's important to kind of have those those fundamentals down. But once you're actually actually working, it's it's kind of the the other skills that stand out as as more important. Um, and in terms of you know trying to figure out where you might want to go career wise, one thing that has worked for me is finding overlaps between the things that I enjoy doing and want to do. Um, and what's needed in different industries. And that's kind of how I took my interest in material science and was able to sort of shift that into um, a focus on advanced manufacturing um, while working. So yeah, that's that's everything I had. Um, like I said, I'm happy to answer questions about any topic, um, even things beyond you know what I brought up specifically. Perfect. Yeah, we'll move into our Q&A then. Um, so anybody, any questions that you have, you can either put them in the chat or you can like raise your hand and I can call on you to like unmute yourself and ask your question uh, on your own. But either way, yeah, toss any questions you guys have in the chat. We have some time to answer them. I'll start with one. Um, Nina, at the beginning of your presentation, you had kind of mentioned that you had been given the advice that it's easier to switch out of being an engineer than it is to switch into like an engineering field in college. Did yeah. you kind of feel like having some of that pressure removed, like made it easier going into like that line of schooling? Um, I think to an extent, yeah, I was definitely definitely worried that I would sort of get to engineering and not like it. Um, and the way my program was structured, my first year of college was all those kind of math, science, computer science classes. And then I got to my second year. And um, in that first semester, I was in four engineering classes. And that was like the first time I was ever doing engineering. And so I was definitely worried that I, that I wasn't going to like it. Um, and so I did definitely find there was some pressure off knowing knowing that you know if I if I didn't like engineering I still kind of had the time to switch into a, a different field um, I think that that's the main thing that a lot of times engineering programs are just a little bit more structured they have more requirements that you sort of have to do um, earlier on um, so so yeah it was kind of nice knowing that if I don't like it I can I can do something else yeah no absolutely that makes sense um Dia asked, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, was it hard to find internships in college? Um, I would say yes and no. I think um, in my, my first year, a lot of times it's really hard to find something after your first year of college because, you know, you haven't really taken many engineering classes yet, if any. Um, and so it's, it's hard to, it's hard for a company or organization to, you know, bring you on and and have you be able to figure things out. Um, so that's why the, the first year I stayed on campus for the summer and did research. So it was pretty easy to be able to find an opportunity um, on campus. So I knew I knew several people who had done that. In terms of the, the later ones, um, I think it definitely, definitely took a lot of effort and there were a lot of different opportunities that I applied to before I ended up getting, getting selected for something. Um, I, I leaned a lot on some of the uh, older students in in my program who shared information about you know things that had worked for them. Um, so I I knew a few people who had been able to intern at NASA kind of the summer after their second year. So that was sort of my like I guess my top target for that summer. Um, and then I had other things that I applied to as well. And it was really I just spent a lot of time in talking to people who had had internships that. I thought I would want to have and figuring out what worked for them in the application process. And then just kind of, yeah, you know, at a certain point you have to just apply for lots of different things and, and see what comes through. Um, and then with the other two, since it was through the fellowships, it was a little bit different. Once I knew that I was, that I'd been selected for the fellowships, I knew they would kind of help match me with an internship. Um, so the application process was a little bit different there since it was the, um, you know, it was focused on, the fellowship application instead of a separate internship. 
That makes sense. Thank you. Um, Annika asked, who was your biggest role model growing up? Um, let's see. I think the, the first one that came to mind when I saw that in the chat um, was probably Sally Ride, um, who was the first American woman to, to go to space. Um, I had, I think I got a book about her um, one year in elementary school and, and just thought that she was very cool. Um, I think beyond that, though, I, I don't know, and eventually found a lot of times my biggest role models were more, it, it was people who were sort of, um, like closer to me in experience than I expected. So like when I, when I started college, there was a group of students who had started the rocketry club, like just the year before that. Um, so there was one student in particular from that group who was kind of one of my biggest role models while in college. Once I started working, um, I had a couple sort of primary mentors on my team um, and they kind of became my base role model there. So I think it's it's changed as time has gone on where I've kind of connected more with people who were, were closer to me as opposed to um, like literal astronauts. Thank you. That makes sense too. Um, Julia, I see your hand is up. You can ask your question. First, I just want to say thank you so much for everything that you've shared already. I've loved hearing from you. And as you kind of broke down the different people that you interact with in your day-to-day -day work, I made me think about how you must interact with a lot of different kinds of engineers. And so uh, are there two or three areas of engineering that are specifically uh, very interesting to you aside from what you studied in college? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, let's see, I think one, so the first one I can think of was probably um, like structural engineering and structural analysis. So especially with those, um, the different environmental testing requirements that we have. So um, everything usually has to go through vibration testing and then thermal testing. And there's a whole team whose job is basically to simulate our different components in those environments and see how well they will work before we've actually done the test. Um, that way, you know, if the simulation is good enough, then we're convinced it's not going to break and then we actually go and try it. Um, so yeah, that's one that that is always stood out to me. Um, and then the other one, I don't know that I would necessarily want to have this job, but one of the, the teams we worked with the most um, was the electrical engineers working on avionics. So our avionics boxes are, you know, you basically take um, a circuit card and then you package it up to protect it. Um, and there are just, there's so many little components on those things and so many things that can go wrong. So that was probably the team where we just, we worked with them quite a lot. Um, and it's just, yeah, it's definitely, definitely cool learning about all, all those different things. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Isabella, do you, I see your hand is up. You can ask your question. Engineering for a lot of part of, until like recently, it's been a more male dominated culture. Do you feel like this thing of you being hindered in continuing with engineering just because you're a woman? Um, I wouldn't say that, that I feel hindered just because I'm a woman. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the, the teams that I'm on are definitely male dominated, but it's something that sort of changed over time. I know a lot of a lot of schools and companies are starting to have a lot more, a lot more, a lot more um, women engineers, and I'd say in general there are just a lot of really, really cool opportunities for lots of different, different problem solving and, and different challenges to be tackled. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, I I see from Lauren in the chat. Um, she asked, um, just if you could say again which college you attended and then what your um, degrees were, because I know you had a major and a minor. Yeah, I, I actually don't know if I mentioned it. I know I didn't have it on the slide. Um, I, I went to Princeton for both undergrad and grad school. Um, so for both of those, I was in the mechanical and aerospace engineering department. While I was an undergrad, I, I did um, a minor in material science. And then when I was in grad school, we didn't have like official minors or anything but it was just a much more flexible program. So most of the classes and research that I did were again, focused on uh, material science and I started to explore more about manufacturing as well. Thank you. Um, I see, I think Isabella also had a couple other questions in the chat. There was one of, um, do you feel like engineering um, 
is more like teamwork or individual work? Definitely more teamwork. Um, I yeah, I mean, I don't think there's been a single project I've worked on um, where it was it was just me. It's always it's always working together on a team. Even if you're the the main person working on something, a lot of times there's more. Um, you know, you'll be interacting with team members or or managers to get feedback on your work before kind of sharing it more broadly. Um, and yeah, I think pretty much everything that I work on. You know, we also have to kind of share what we're doing, whether that's, you know, officially presenting it or just kind of documenting it somewhere for for others to learn. Um, so, yeah, definitely more teamwork. That makes total sense. Um, I'm looking through some other questions in the chat. Um, there's another one from Isabella, which kind of ties into um, the question that she had asked. Um about if like being a woman in, in engineering kind of hindered, do you feel, um, is there ever like any bro culture that's like anything you have to kind of contend with? Yeah, I think I think that definitely um, kind of varies team to team, but it, it is there in some cultures. So I mentioned that, you know, in previous, my, my previous manufacturing role, I just found that the culture wasn't a great fit. And part of it um, was due to a little bit of what, you know, you could probably describe as, as bro culture. Um, but I've also found that, you know, it's really important having different um, kind of allies and, and mentors in the workplace. So pretty much every every team that I've been on, there's been at least one person in a leadership position who I felt comfortable going to, if anything ever came up, either either minor or major. Um, and, and yeah, I think a lot of times, you know, it's it's sort of finding those teams where you where you have allies and where you feel comfortable bringing it up when something when something feels a little bit off. Um, and, and yeah, just kind of finding, finding a way to, to be in an environment where you're kind of comfortable and, and will do your best work. No, I think that's, I think it's so important to have like mentors and people also just like that you work with that you feel comfortable to like approach yeah. about those things. And then also just to feel like you have, you're in a work community and workspace that people have your back. That's always good. Um, right. And, and just adding on that real quick, you know, I think a yeah. lot of times, you know, if people, if people kind of make, make comments that are kind of like accidentally sexist, I found a lot of times they don't, they don't mean it at all, at all. They either just didn't think of the impact of what they were saying, or it's just coming from a place of ignorance. And so, especially if you're, you're on a team where you can trust people and you feel comfortable. I know every team I've been on, I, I've been able to kind of tell someone be like, Hey, like, you know, next time it might be better if you say, if you say this instead and just kind of pointing out the the issue with with what they did um politely and respectfully I, I've never kind of gotten pushback for doing that no that's really great advice um Julie I see you have your hand raised if you want to ask your question I know that you mentioned the that you're on a three-year rotation at Northrop Grumman and that sounds amazing uh, in terms of different opportunities within the company are there other opportunities that you uh, see is very competitive, but the best in terms of learning. Um, like specifically to Northrop, or just generally, generally in the industry. Specifically to Northrop Grumman, but if there are other things that you find very interesting, I'd love to hear about those as well. Yeah, so I I think the the biggest one um would be the Burke Owens Fellowship that I mentioned. Um, that's just yeah, it's been a really great like community to be part of and you know, everyone who's involved with it can kind of point to some example or another where it really helped their career. Um, I think a lot of big aerospace companies have a very similar rotation program structure to Northrop. So I know of three kind of formal rotation programs. The first one um, is called Pathways, where it's, it's for students coming right out of undergrad. And I think they do either eight or nine month rotations. Um, and a lot of times those are all like at one site, um, there's kind of less opportunity to travel. But the one that that I'm doing is for people who have either a master's or a PhD. And it's, yeah, so it's people with a graduate degree, but still within the earlier phases of their career. I think you need to have at most three years of experience when you apply. Um, and with that, so we do the rotations, but we also have other, other really cool um, career development um, opportunities. So last week I was at one of our um, biannual learning forums where they bring together everyone in the rotation program 
for different presentations about, you know, different technologies or strategies, different things going on within the company. Um, and also just a way to kind of kind of meet people and and see tours. So I got to see um, a solar array manufacturing facility, which is very cool. I didn't know that was a thing we manufacture in house, but we do. Um, and then the third kind of formal program I, I know of at Northrop is the Systems Engineering Associates program. So that's more for people who are um, a little bit further along in their careers. I think it's people with three to eight years of experience, and that's specifically focused on systems engineering. So kind of learning what you would need to know in order to have some of the different systems engineering leadership roles. So things like being um, a chief engineer or um, the systems engineering integration and test lead or a systems architect, there's a few different different roles um, that, that they cover. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of a lot of big aerospace companies have something kind of similar where it's like, you know, right out of college, one that's sort of early career, but a little bit more of like a leadership spin on it, and then stuff for for mid career. And, and all these companies are also constantly adding new programs. So I'm constantly learning about new things that that Northrop offers, even if it's not you know, a full rotation program like what I'm doing, they have lots of different mentorship opportunities or ways to kind of learn about learn about different fields, kind of, you know, just a few hours a week learning about something as a way to advance your career. Those sound like great experiences and opportunities. Thank you for sharing. Sure. I think we have time for like one more question. We had a follow up on the internships question. Um, uh, Dia had asked, how big of an effect do the grades you get in your major related classes and extracurriculars matter? I think kind of like, you know, in relation to getting an internship. Yeah, so so I had actually asked my my boss at NASA basically that exact question. Like, what are the things that that you look at when selecting interns? That way I could go back and and tell other students here, this is what, what to kind of emphasize in your application. And he said for him... Um, one of the biggest things was the fact that I was, I had already taken a material science class. So because it was a material science focused team, he wanted something who had someone who had that specific um, background knowledge. Um, so if there's specific, if there's something within the internship posting um, that you can specifically tie to a class that you've taken or a project you've done, you've done, really emphasize that. I think people care a lot more about you know, knowledge and experience that you have as opposed to the grade. Um, I think in general, you know, he did say kind of somewhere in sort of the middle of the list that he cares about grades and knowing that you're sort of doing well in your engineering classes. Um, I think a lot of times um, from what I've seen, a lot of places will have sort of a, a minimum GPA cutoff um, where I've seen I've seen it either be like a 3.0 or a 3.25, sometimes 2.75. It depends. Call it around a three, so around a B average. Um, but as long as you meet that threshold, a lot of times they don't actually care what your GPA is, um, as long as you like meet the the HR requirements. So don't worry too much, you know, if you're kind of like 0.1 off here or there. Um, and then yeah, I would I would say extracurriculars might matter a little bit more just because you can get sort of that more unique experience and and learn more about sort of um, like teamwork, collaboration, leadership, things like that, um, in addition to kind of the, the content you're learning in your classes. Thank you so much, Nina. Um, if anybody has any questions that, that either didn't get answered or like after the session, they pop in your head, you can always email them to outreach at sweet.org and I will pass them on to Nina. I'm putting the email in the chat just so you guys have it if you need it. Um, but thank you everybody for joining us for tonight's session. Nina, thank you so much for coming and um, talking with us and telling us about your career and your educational journey. Um, it it's, was incredibly fascinating and you had such great advice to share with us and I really appreciate it. Um, I'll give another shout out to um, our sponsors, which are Honda, ExxonMobil, Honeywell, Avnet, Catherine McQuaid Foundation, and Danaher. Um, for everybody that's here, this session was recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. I will send out that link. It'll probably be up either at the end of this week or early next week. Um, so you guys can always revisit this whenever you wish and you'll get more email updates from me for the next um, Sheila session. But 
Um, that should be it for tonight. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your evening.